Okay, welcome to another counter-hegemonic chat, and our special guest today is Dr. Mawa Osman from the beautiful Kiam Valley in South Lebanon. Behind her, you can see in the haze there a little bit the Jabal al-Sheikh on the border with Syria, and uh, the Sheba farms occupied and illegally occupied part of Lebanon, occupied by the, the Zionist uh, outfit there. And a little bit to the other side, slightly out of view, is the Jolan Heights, which is a part of Syria, occupied by the same crowd there too. So welcome, Mawa. Thanks for coming along and, and helping us discuss this topic, which is the crisis in Lebanon. Uh, and I think we're going to start with the economic crisis and move into the strategic situation of Lebanon and uh, the questions of the resistance. Um, so first of all, can I ask, um, could you just outline what are the main elements that led to or, or, or the, the factors that contributed to the recent economic crisis in Lebanon? Well, thank you very much, uh, Tim and Jay, for this chat. Uh, to begin with, the recent uh, crisis is not so uh, recent. It's actually uh, been anticipated ever since this system was uh, maybe uh, put forward by uh, people who just got out of the civil war in Lebanon and took control of the regime in Lebanon up until today. We're talking uh, starting 1977 up until now. This is how old this crisis has uh, been anticipated to happen. But uh, it happened right now for uh, reasons that I will talk about later on. But to start with, the main economic problem in Lebanon right now is that uh, our peg to the dollar, our lira peg to the dollars since uh, the early 90s, which was uh, proposed by uh, the late Rafi' al-Halili and his uh, friends at that time, uh, was unhealthy. It is even illogical, financially speaking. Uh, this peg was fixed to 1,500 Lebanese lira to the dollar for more than 30 years. But the uh, real uh, uh, the currency was actually uh, uh, decreasing in value. Uh, the, the currency should have been uh, changing towards the dollar as it should uh, explain uh, the real situation, economic situation in Lebanon, because when you have a, a currency, you should be able to have an economy that uh, pulls this uh, currency up. For example, we don't have an uh, agricultural economy, we don't have an, an industrial economy. We just have uh, a service-based uh, economy, which means we sell services, we import products and then sell them, and then we just sit as a rentier economy waiting on uh, Lebanese abroad to send money, to send US mm -hmm. dollars into the country. This worked out for like 25 years, but then it stopped working out when the uh, US sanctions and the Western sanctions started playing out uh, in the region against, uh, uh, which they were supposedly or allegedly against the Lebanese resistance in Lebanon and further in Syria, for example, but especially in Lebanon, they started uh, targeting financial institutions like banks, uh, like uh, other uh, transferring money institutions like, uh, for example, the Western Union or MoneyGram. Uh, but basically, it's the system, the financial capitalist system that has been put in place in the Lebanese banks. The Lebanese banks were taking a lot while, the, while our lira was packed to the dollar, the Lebanese banks were taking huge loans from the uh, central bank in Lebanon. Uh, and uh, without either without interest with, or with very uh, uh, little uh, interest. What happened is the banks where the people keep their savings, either if you go on pension or if you're getting paid your salary, et cetera, et cetera, or if you have a savings account that you uh, put in, uh, in place in the banking system of Lebanon, which, by the way, was advertised and promoted as the best uh, financial banking system in, uh, uh, on the planet, second to the Swiss uh, banking system, uh, because we we don't get asked where you got your money from. This is why uh, the elite mm. were very happy with the banking system. Uh, so what happened is the people put their money in the banks. Uh, the banks were very much um, into getting more money out of this money. So they had a deal with uh, the Lebanese uh, bank, central bank, Banque du Liban, uh, headed by Riyad Salemi, the uh, head of this uh, bank, uh, so they could deposit the money in the central bank and take very, very high interest from the state bank, which is the central bank. They took the people's money, they put it in the central bank. The central bank ended up giving the money to the government in loans, in forms of loans. The government took the money, they never paid the interest, they never paid uh, the, the actual uh, loan back. 
and uh, a lot of people who are elite, bourgeois, you can name it whatever you want, the ruling class in Lebanon were uh, benefiting a lot from these zero interest loans. We're talking about millions of dollars here, which are the people's money, the middle class and the poor people's money. And then out of for the people, it was out of nowhere, but for the past seven years, we've been reading economic reports saying that there are no more dollars in the central bank to keep up with the uh, actual spending in Lebanon, meaning there are no more dollars to buy uh, fuel, there are no more uh, dollars to buy gasoline, to buy uh, medicine, because uh, uh, you practically know that Lebanon is more of a, a social capitalist country, which means that uh, the country actually has uh, medicine that is available for everyone. Medicine is fairly affordable. It was fairly affordable. Uh, insurance was um, also affordable to uh, the majority of the Lebanese through the, uh, uh, the, the government insurance or through other uh, ways through the Ministry of Health. So that was also viable and uh, everyone would, can, could be able to, like they could afford to get treated, they could afford to buy medicine. That was before the crisis. But then no more dollars in the central bank to uh, cover these costs, uh, even to cover the costs of bread, because, you know, wheat is also uh, uh, helped out by, uh, paid for by the government and sold in very low prices uh, before this crisis happened. So no more money. The money was literally vaporized. The loans that were taken by the central bank were uh, transferred outside of Lebanon in one year, one year from 2019 up until now, beginning July 2019 up until now, more than six billion U.S. dollars were transferred out of the Lebanese banks by the elite in Lebanon. And we're talking about this money that is owned by the people, middle class mm. and poorer classes in Lebanon. So when the people try to get their money back from the banks, there is no more money. They just have numbers in their accounts, but there is no actual money. This was mm. the biggest drop in history. This just, just takes the place of the Ponzi scheme. The Ponzi scheme means nothing in front of what happened in Lebanon. They should call it the Riyadh Salemi scheme. But uh, anyways, this mm. is just in, in a couple of words uh, uh, what happened. But to add to that, as I said, we don't have a viable economy. We don't we don't grow our own food or if we do, it's just uh, uh, the best uh, the creme de la creme gets uh, exported. We don't see them. We have the best kind of apples grown in Lebanon, but we never see them as uh, citizens. They are get they get imported. Uh, we don't have our basic needs uh, uh, found in Lebanon. You don't find them. You don't find uh, Lebanese made medicine or you don't find um, Lebanese made uh, T-shirts, cars, you name it. Anything we eat, anything we wear, anything we drive is imported. Hence, we don't have an economy. Uh, plus, mm. add to that, we had the pandemic, the COVID-19 affected a lot of uh, people economically because of the shutdown and the lockdown uh, uh, imposed by the government. So we have our own financial class, uh, crisis. Add to that, the global pandemic and the lockdown. And now we are back into lockdown because our numbers are going very high uh, day by day. We have reached now, uh, lately, we have reached 224 cases per day is a disaster for such a small country. Uh, when I say it's a disaster, because we don't have a healthcare that's a healthcare sector that's uh, up to the challenge that could actually have uh, enough ventilators for the people who will be needing them. But anyways, this plus the crisis added to that the uh, try to find suitable words for them, but the gangsters, the looters, the mafia men in Lebanon who control from meat to chicken to gasoline. Now we don't have electricity, especially in areas where there are supporters of the resistance, mainly in those areas. We don't have electricity or gasoline because, because of the sanctions. Just today, two of the major companies that are owned by people of pro-resistance were shut down, or they have uh, gasoline stations, they were shut down because of uh, certain uh, allegations that had no proof there was no proof uh, towards them having their gasoline uh, uh, being, um, uh, it was said that they, that they were keeping their gasoline to sell them at higher prices. There was no proof for that, but they just targeted these specific companies mm. and they shut them down. So that's now, also- Mama, can, I just, what, can I just go back a little bit? Because just to work the way through for people who haven't followed it at all. So you're saying there's a, there was a brewing banking crisis coming for some years, basically. Yeah. And um, before we get to the COVID crisis this year, 
Before that, we've got this budget by the former Hariri government, which catalyzed yeah. protests. Can you just walk us through that that part of it before we come to this year? Uh, well, uh, it catalyzed protest. Well, protests began uh, way back in 2000 and uh, 2007, 2008, just after the Lebanese uh, uh, people endured the massive uh, genocidal war, the Israeli war in 2006, just a couple of months after that, we, we started having uh, protests. The protest, uh, you know, Lebanon is a sectarian uh, country and everything is politicized. Uh, at that time, the government was pushing against the resistance. The basic uh, protests were uh, to protect the resistance and at the same time to tell the people that we will not accept any sort of suffocating because we are part of the resistance. Move just uh, fast forward to 2015 when we had the uh, garbage uh, situation in Lebanon when it was not being collected because, again, sectarianism and uh, the elite were not happy with one another. When they fight, we get swamped with uh, uh, garbage. Uh, so they also didn't find a solution or fast enough, they didn't find a solution for that. People went down to the street because this was killing everyone. It causes a scan, so well, it causes the solution that, tell me about uh, the solu Isn't the solution there that there, there's not really a functioning public service and so there has to be some commercial solution which has some benefit for each of the, the sectarian leaders, basically. I mean, the garbage solution the had a commercial whatever, there, whatever the solution was, it was always rejected by one party uh, or the other. For example, if one of the solutions is to have uh, certain uh, uh, er dumping areas for the garbage, one, uh, let's say the dumping area was chosen to be right here in, in Khiam. The people in the area would suggest, why would we have to accept uh, garbage coming from the Baka, for example, to be dumped in uh, Khiam? And this is just an example. And so forth on the entire Lebanese land. We came up to a certain point that, okay, just give this job back to the municipalities and let every municipality in every district deal with its own uh, garbage. Even then, we had problems, problems because this meant that the elite will not be making money out of this uh, situation anymore. We even had solutions coming from Europe where certain European countries were saying, look, we would buy your garbage just as is. We would pay for them. Give <laughs> your garbage to us. And they refused because they refused how the commission will be split. This is not a country. Mm. Trust me. It, it's a mafia. Men just uh, taking control over a swath of land, sadly, despite the fact that it's a very beautiful swath of land. But this is the case. Now, fast forward again to what happened last year in September uh, and October 2019. We had in one week fires that ate up hundreds of acres in the Lebanese mountains. The, the government did absolutely nothing. We had planes that were able to uh, put out the fire, but they were out of service because they were not maintained. No maintenance was done over the planes for more than 10 years. Uh, the government did absolutely nothing. People were trapped in their houses while the fire was eating up the mountains. That's number one. In the same week, we had the Lebanese... Uh, back then, the Lebanese uh, Minister of uh, Communication decided to put uh, taxes on WhatsApp. And, you know, Internet is mm, the only yeah. here now left for the people to uh, maybe enjoy themselves or to feel a bit free. Uh, this is what happened. He, he said that he will be uh, adding taxes on WhatsApp, which is, by the way, illegal, according to the company. Uh, but he, he decided to do that. And this was what uh, started or sparked uh, the post protest of uh, 17th on, of, of, of October. And I'll tell you, I was part and of that. And protest. until then, the, 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 the lira days. had been the lira had maintained its value against the dollar. Up. Was that when the lira started to crash? Yes. When the leader mm. started to crash just after uh, one week after the protests began, because when that began, out of the blue, banks decided to shut their door to, to go on, on uh, self-imposed lockdown. No one knew why. No one was targeting banks. Yes, the first day I went to the streets on October 17. Yes, I did have a poster that says the Salemi is uh, a thief and the banks are the main problem. And there were hundreds of people like me, but we were not targeting any banks. We were actually having protests in the Martyr Square in the Beirut main district uh, near Beirut, Souks, just uh, near uh, uh, the coastal line of Beirut. No one was attacking any bank, but the banks, self-imposed lockdown 
grew uh, a lot of questions in the minds of the Lebanese. Why would they do that? The moment they reopened two weeks after their uh, their lockdown, we started seeing the lira just dollar just go up uh, against the lira. The lira was depreciating so fast that people were not understanding what was happening. This led to the people to go in masses to the uh, banks. It's happened to me personally. I went to the bank. I, I don't trust banks, so I don't put a lot of money in the bank. But I did have a couple of uh, uh, an amount of, of money in a certain bank. They wouldn't give me my money. I had to go live on Twitter to make them give me my money. I had to <laughs> them. I went live on Twitter. I had more than, I think it was more than 12,000 views in three hours. The head of the branch called me. I was going to give my class at the university. He was like, please turn around and come back. Take your money, but just take down your uh, video. He was like, you have to wait for me. I'm going to finish my class. My students are not going to wait for me. You're going to have to wait for me. I finish my class. You prepare my money. When I get my money, I'll take off my video. And this is exactly what happened. But imagine millions of Lebanese people getting their money trapped because the top 1% just stole their money, blatantly out there, stole their money with the help of the banks. And you know the rest of what happened throughout this year. Well, but except that our, our lost move. Start, I mean, really, the, the lira starts to collapse. Then there's a period before the plague comes along where you've got what do they say, you know, a, politicized, a rapid politicization of the protests, right? There's sort of yeah. a is yes. that interim, can you fill out that interim period there up until when the plague comes along? Yeah, well, when like every protest that goes on anywhere on the planet, you have people who uh, would either uh, come along who have nothing to do with the, with the, with the protests, or you have a people who need to shift the targets of the protest towards something that does not affect them. Meaning, mm. I took part in the protests for nine days, but when uh, the person who I trust the most in Lebanon, who's uh, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, this is not a secret, you just, just Google my name, you could know everything about me, who I support. So it's not a secret, I'm not afraid of hiding it. So when that man who was very supportive, he's still supportive up until now for every protest against uh, whether banks, the government uh, being um, uh, uh, unaccounted for or being responsible, etc. He is pro these protests. He, he is part of the people. He's suffering just like the, the, the same way we are suffering. But when that man on the ninth day of the protests uh, went on screen and said, look, it's no longer uh, a protest for uh, social justice. It's no longer a protest against the financial uh, situation and the banking sector in Lebanon. There are certain groups with their, with the resistance intelligence, there were certain groups that were found to try to affect the, the flow of the protests. And we did end up seeing that despite the fact that it took months for other people who did not uh, maybe not believe his words, but they thought that he was exaggerating. It took them months to understand what he was saying because we started seeing in Beirut protests against the weapons of the resistance. What does that have to do mm, with the financial mm. crisis? What does that have to do with the dollar, with the banking sectors? This has, this has nothing. This is a blatant out Israeli demand. This is what it is. Mm. So in but, that but man, in, that, in the Lebanese that, context, it's coming from the losers of the 2018 election, more or less, isn't it? The the Future Party and the Jaja Party, for example. Uh, well, uh, the Jaja Party actually, after the the elections, won more seats than he had because of the new electoral uh, electoral law. Uh, that's not the case. But now he has more people presenting his party uh, uh, relative to how much way his party actually has. It's incompatible to, for example, how much the resistance had, despite the fact that resistance, if we take numbers, they have more than a million and a half supporters in Lebanon, supporters who actually vote for them, not uh, to, uh, who are able to vote for them. So if you talk about the major supporters, numbers are much higher than that. If you talk about the free patriotic movement and the Merada, uh, the uh, uh, et They weren't in government though, were they? Uh, Shaja wasn't in government? Uh, Jaja was, I think, yes, he did have one minister. Uh, she oh. was the minister of uh, of culture, despite the fact that she has nothing to do with culture. But that's not our topic for for that for now. But um, uh, 
what happened through the protests is every party that had a certain target in its head to protect itself, especially the parties that are closest to the uh, 1% in Lebanon, who started the spanking sector to begin with, uh, just neglecting all the signs and all the uh, concern that was coming from experts in, in economy and political economy. Uh, they were shouting for the past 15 to 20 years that this is a problem we cannot just live as if we are a banking sector society. This is not going to work. There will come a day when this entire, uh, if you want, uh, this entire uh, uh, mausoleum will just fall on our heads. We can't accept that. So they didn't uh, hear that. They made the money that they uh, were able to make. They basically stole the money that they were able to, stole, to, to steal. And at the same time, they were just sucking all the resources of the country from uh, mountains that were vanishing because of uh, 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 you know, um, companies that uh, make cement or stones or etc. They just break down the mountain. They're changing ecosystems, entire ecosystems, just to make more money. Or uh, from and the roadblocks, uh, the roadblocks set in in that in that period too. What was behind you, that? The, the, all the roadblocks in the country. The roadblocks started happening in certain areas. Only the same areas, time and time again. Uh, areas that are controlled by Jumblat, Jaja, and Saad al Hariri, only there. Why would you have a roadblock on a highway that people usually drive uh, 100 kilometers uh, uh, per hour uh, on that uh, highway where you have absolutely nothing on the sides, not even stores? Why would you make roadblocks there when people are going home or going uh, back and forth from uh, work to their houses? And you don't go do certain roadblocks at the Kilon Yani Kilon. Everybody, everybody is corrupt. Why don't you go to the everybody who's corrupt and close mm. down their street, close down their companies, close down their uh, security uh, companies, their financial companies? That they own everything in this country. You know them. Why don't you go, for example, to uh, their uh, the areas where they have massive warehouses for fuel, where they uh, secure their fuel there and then stop selling people. They they monopolize the fuel because they want to sell it at higher play, uh, prices than that that they bought from the government. They buy gasoline at, at 16,000 liras from the government and sell it to the people per gallon. They want to sell it to the people at 35,000 to 40,000 Lebanese liras per gallon. This is This is theft. You cannot have another name for it. Why don't you go block their roads? Why don't you go and block the roads for the people who are not allowing you to send uh, um, a swift? You're not allowed to send money because the banks in, in America are blocking the money that we are sending to other banks across the world in order to buy wheat, in order to buy... Uh, you can hear me? You still can hear me? Yeah, 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 we can. Yeah. I was just going to ask for in a clarification there, though, that that um that with that with the banks blocking things and i know i have some experience of that too um because of the there are partial sanctions on certain parties in lebanon um yeah. and the central bank is compliant with what the u.s government wants there but it must appear yeah, yeah. rather arbitrary because no one is saying this is the hezbollah bank of so and so this is so and so uh so the u.s is imposing its own ideas of who they think are linked to the resistance and must it must appear rather arbitrary as to who is being blocked and when. And this is now, I'll tell you, this is an effective way of, of punishing everybody. And when I say it's effective, because it's actually uh, getting on board people that have nothing to do with the resistance, except that they just support their country having a resistance against an enemy that has committed incremental genocide against their country time and again, killing the people, incarcerating the people, stealing the land, stealing the, uh, the, the fuel, stealing our own oil from the sea basically stealing everything. Now they want to steal our own lifestyle, our life, our uh, spendings, our savings, our everything. Even the, when we want to spend to buy wheat, they take away the, our money or they just don't allow us to, uh, they don't allow the SWIFT to actually take place. So uh, this is basically what happened. This led to discredit Lebanon on a lot of financial uh, uh, spectrums. This led to companies who we used for uh, uh, tens of years to uh, operate with at the level of the government, I mean, to buy, for example, gasoline. This led to the companies to not uh, trust the Lebanese government anymore. They, they used to send us the gasoline be before even receiving the money. They Now they want to receive the money before they even send the ship 
out to sea. So this makes a lot of uh, problems. This stops a lot of lives. This stops a lot of uh, people from going to their daily uh, jobs. I mean, people who have uh, very simple uh, jobs like uh, an aesthetic, for example, a hairdresser cannot operate because they don't have electricity. A hospital cannot operate. They need generators. Now the generators need uh, gasoline or what we call as, as mazot gas. Uh, it's not there because it's being monopolized uh, or if it's uh, not monopolized it's not there because the ships have not docked yet in beirut so even hospitals now are worried that the, the machines would be stopped people it could you imagine being operated on and then lose electricity this is horrific this has never mm. happened in any war against lebanon and m mind you if you think about every spectrum of our lives what we eat again what we wear how we operate meat Meat is now unaffordable for people in Lebanon. Mm. Even if you want to buy, you know how much it costs now for one kilo of, of, uh, of lemon? 8,000 Lebanese lira, which means each lemon is 1,000 Lebanese lira. How would a family of five or six who have limited budget in their uh, monthly payments be able to buy lemon? They can't buy lemon. Mm. Mind so you, they can't it, buy is it, is it right to uh, say that by the time the, the you know the airport closes down in uh, the borders close down in in the middle of March, most of this economic crisis has un unfolded already before the before yes, the additional yes, flow. Yes. Way, way before that, but when the airports closed, we saw uh, our lira dropping down to to uh, levels that I personally would not have expected. I expected to see one dollar equal ten thousand Lebanese lira by the beginning of 2021, not by March or April. We spiked 4,000 Lebanese lira within less than three weeks. It was disastrous for people, disastrous. And to add uh, salt to the injury, uh, all the banks would not give you dollars anymore, even if you, uh, we already established the fact that you cannot uh, withdraw your dollars from the bank. But even if you want to go and take your Lebanese lira and just get rid of it, take uh, dollars instead, there's no dollars. You could go to... Uh, um, transferring uh, stores or stores that use really uh, just uh, change currency, currency uh, uh, stores which are found everywhere in Lebanon, they shut down. They no longer operate it because either they don't have dollars or they just don't want to sell the dollars at this rate because they know at some point it's just going to uh, it's going to be a loss for them because the Lebanese lira is depreciating so fast. It's, it's losing its uh, uh, actual uh, uh, worth so fast at the point that they would be losing if they buy Lebanese lira uh, from the people at that rate. So it was disastrous. Uh, people would go down to the um, uh, up until now, they would uh, go down to the supermarket, for example, to buy uh, let's say uh, some uh, powder milk or cheese, just, you know, the processed cheese, it costs yeah, at, at a certain, in, in less than two months, it would cost uh, 2,000 Lebanese lira. They would buy it now for 25,000 Lebanese lira and their salaries mm -hmm. are still fixed. There's no change to the salaries. They're still getting paid the same amount of money. If you're getting paid 1 million Lebanese lira, which before the crisis was about Eight hundred dollars now. One million Lebanese lira is like a hundred and maybe ten dollars maximum. Mm, so that's mm. a disaster. How are they going to operate when everything that they buy is already imported, which means it has to be uh, priced according to the dollar amount of dollars that was bought upon from outside Lebanon? How can you imagine people will be able to eat cheese? They stop eating cheese. People started making cheese in their own houses. They start. People stop buying ketchup. They started making mm. their own ketchup at home. Soap, the same thing. Everything now is DIY because they can't afford it anymore. Never mind meat, chicken, etc. Some people just stopped seeing those in their houses. When you saw the AFP report about having uh, uh, the AP report, I'm sorry about about people with empty uh, fridges. That's 100 percent true. And that's now the majority of the people in Lebanon. Jay, would you like to come in at this stage? Well, I can understand why, uh, you know, the General Secretary of Hezbollah, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, declared, he said, we must all go back to being farmers in order to become a sovereign people. And it makes sense, you know, you go to some parts of Lebanon, especially in Beirut, and you think there's no way that uh, these people would ever, you know, ratchet down their living standards. But on top of that, I wanted to bring in the, 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 the geostrategic situation. So I think, you know, relating to the economic problems, 
um, in the past, I think Lebanon relied a lot on Syria and took for granted the fact that Syria was a productive economy. And it made up for the fact that Lebanon really didn't produce a lot, imported a lot, especially cheap agricultural goods from Syria. And now that uh, now that Syria is under sanctions, now that the United States is occupying everywhere north of the Euphrates and preventing Syrians from taking their wheat to the food depots so that they can so that it can circulate around the rest of the country. It's causing immense hardship there. Um, do you think there's a change in the uh, in the attitude towards Syria among the previous opponents of the Syrian government among within Lebanon? Like because ah, that's unfortunate because. You know, I think I thought I thought that maybe in, in a situation like this, they would realize, OK, we, we took Syria for granted. Now that the Syrian economy has collapsed, our economy is not doing too well either. Look, let me tell you something. We have uh, people who are against the uh, uh, the resistance access in general in Lebanon who are mm. pro the U.S., uh, pro even pro Israel at some points uh, uh, in Lebanon. They don't mind to see starvation. I'm not even exaggerating. They don't mind to see people in Lebanon starving for food, thirst, having no electricity, no water, you name it. But they would never accept going back to the Lebanese, to the Syrian government. Why? Mm. Simple answer. They are not allowed to do so. They are too much afraid to do so. Even if they think about it in their own closed, I don't know, rooms or something. They are not even allowed to say, despite the fact that they know that the only mm. way out of this is to have a conversation, communication with the Syrian government, with the Iraqi government. They did start with the Iraqi government, but we heard a lot, a lot of noise around this. Just think about what would happen if we start a communication with, with the Syrian government. Mind you, the resistance has its own uh, relationship with uh, Syria. We're not talking about the resistance. They are able to get anything from Syria and Syria would be happy to provide. But the resistance would be actually helping its own people. And this is what the resistance does not want. They don't want mm -hmm. that. You know why? Because this, this will just create more hatred towards the supporters of the resistance in Lebanon. Hezbollah, I'll be flat out clear here. Hezbollah wants to help all of Lebanon because they know that if just one side of Lebanon is helped out of this crisis, the other side will just become the enemy of this side. This is not what we, this is exactly what Israel wants. They want us to go against one another in Lebanon. But our, uh, if you want the resistance foes in, in, in uh, Lebanon, who, their uh, political uh, competitors, if you want, it's not the case. They, they can't even compete at the political uh, uh, spectrum. But the people who are against the axis of resistance in Lebanon, they cannot find it uh, in themselves to be at least truthful with their own people to tell them that, look, we are just two people in one land. We need to cooperate with one another. These sanctions are hurting everyone. Uh, we need to buy, we can buy uh, gasoline from Syria if you want. We can buy wheat from Syria. We can buy a lot of things and way cheaper because Syria would accept the Lebanese lira. Syria would not demand US dollars uh, from Lebanon. But the sanctions. They made, uh, they made that clear. That's the yeah, problem. They're afraid, yeah. They are afraid of, of, their, uh, of uh, their masters imposing sanctions against them because, you know, the US mm. has no allies. The US, look, the US dropped the Kurds like a hot potato more than nine times in the past couple of years, and they're still their best friends for some yeah. reason. This is exactly the same thing. Oh, well, on, that, on, that same, on that same line, I mean, in the same theme, um, what has been the response in Lebanon or in the broader Lebanon to, on the one hand, the, the shipment of um, goods and food from Iran purchased in Lebanese currency, and economic relations with Iran, and also the proposal from China for um, investing in infrastructure in transport and rail links. What, what's been the general debate around that? Uh, let's begin. The issue with uh, Iranian products, we didn't see that yet. We just saw a couple of uh, um, uh, businessmen inside the uh, pro-resistance areas buying on their own uh, from their own uh, budgets uh, products from Iran, but we didn't see like uh, actual uh, ships docking in Beirut getting help because they will get sanctions. Even the port of Beirut would get sanctions. So there was a, a certain a scenario being told that uh, ships will actually dock in Syria and then 
uh, that the goods would be transported from Syria into Lebanon, but that's another case. I don't think this happened until now. Even if this happens, we're going to hear a lot about it in the mainstream media because they're, they're going to say that they're breaking the uh, Caesar uh, Act and they're now getting goods from Syria, blah, blah, blah. This has, hasn't happened because the mainstream media hasn't sang its song about it yet. But to talk about um, uh, your second part uh, of the question, uh, which I think that, look, China uh, has offered a lot of very good BOT projects for Lebanon. And everyone says that they are very good projects for Lebanon. But did everyone also hear what Dorothy, what Shia said? She blatantly threatened the Lebanese the government. US, US ambassador. Yes, yeah, yeah. she's the US ambassador in Beirut. She is the, uh, what say Nasrullah named her, the military governor of Lebanon. Uh, mm. uh, she basically threatened the Lebanese uh, government. She went to every minister, had meeting with every minister in and, uh, Prime Minister Hassan Diab's government, threatening them not to sign any contracts or have any deals made with China. Because you know why? Because they would sanction everything, everybody. This is what she was saying. She was like holding up. Uh, 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 like uh, uh, a whip against the face of the government saying you're not allowed to go uh, east, you're not allowed to go anywhere. If you don't allow it, it's not going to happen. They allowed Iraq to come to Lebanon. They allowed the Lebanese government to sit with Iraq to talk about certain projects in the future, but we have seen nothing so far. I don't think anything's going to happen. I actually fear for the fate of Iraq to be the same as that in Lebanon. When and uh, it's it's when, not if, when they start uh, opposing, uh, further opposing the uh, American policies in Iraq. But uh, in Lebanon, all the ministers said that the meetings that they did with the Chinese ambassador in Lebanon were very successful. They said that the Chinese were willing to work without getting paid. They want to work BOT with Lebanon. They said that the projects are ready and up to uh, begin the moment the Lebanese government says we are. Uh, we're we know how effective uh, Chinese companies are. We have seen how they build bridges, how they build uh, roads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We need to fix the Lebanese infrastructure in order to start up with some sort of a healthy economy. This will be the basic uh, and most important beginning for any uh, upcoming upcoming future economy, viable future economy for. Lebanon. But again, the US, U.S. is not allowing this. Will the government of Hassan Adir be, be uh, courageous enough to bring upon Chinese uh, companies to help Lebanon out of this situation, at least put the first step in helping Lebanon out of the situation? I don't have an answer for that because today we woke up to the news that our uh, foreign minister uh, or Minister of Foreign Affairs is uh, resigning because he's been mm. blocked so in so many ways by the West, especially by the United States of America, that he came that he came up to a point that look, I cannot do anything. I'm trapped in my office. I'm not allowed to do anything. I just better just go back home. And I think he's mm. going to resign. I don't think he's going to go back on his resignation. This, this is part of what happens when anyone tries to help Lebanon. Mind you, if it's Iran or not, even if it's China, even if it's Russia, even Russia, uh, by the uh, Russian uh, ambassador in, in, in Lebanon, Ambassador Zaspakin, uh, um, wrote a letter from the Russian side to the Lebanese government saying that Russia is willing to help as well. If you have anything in mind, if you want to have uh, meetings, we could facilitate that with uh, all the sectors that are ready to help Lebanon. But again... The American threat. Mm -hmm. And how does the mm -hmm. how does the debate in, the, in Lebanese media respond to being told you are not allowed to do this? I mean, how does what's the Lebanese voice in the media saying when they say you are not allowed to do something? They either just uh, go on have their carnivals, living their summer life like nothing's happening. Or in the pro-resistance media, you have them talking about it day in and day out that it's tiring. But it has to be said mm -hmm. because no one else is saying it. But at the same time, it's being echoed in one chamber because all the pro-resistance media are banned from going on major satellites. They are banned from Facebook. They are banned from Twitter. Even if they have websites, if you don't have VPN, you cannot uh, have access to them. So it's basically like shouting in an empty room. Mm. Yeah, I think like one of the issues here is that uh, Lebanon was initially conceived as a as a kind of Western westernized outpost in an eastern world. And this made life reasonably comfortable for Lebanese so long as the West had money and was powerful and industrially dominant. The West now is broke. 
<laughs> it doesn't have any money to give you anymore. The money is going in the opposite direction. It's leaving money for the West. And the only countries that have the ability to help Lebanon are all in the East. So it's countries like Iran. I mean, Iran's suffering, but they're still helping Lebanon. China is the next great power. They're the productive, you know, superpower. And they're willing to help India. Lebanon. But then India as well. Did you mention India well, or? Well, uh, this is the first time I do mention it, but uh, I, I pretty, I'm pretty sure that if we actually, if our government uh, does uh, its job well, they could get help from India, they could get help from China, from Pakistan, from Iran, uh, from uh, Kazakhstan, from uh, Azerbaijan, even, despite the fact that I have po different political views. Yeah. than that but of they're the, putting all of their eggs in the Western even basket. Even from Turkey as, as well, even from yeah. Turkey. Basically from Turkey as well, because it's very, uh, and it's near uh, Lebanon, despite the fact that yeah. um, the pro-resistance camp is uh, not an enemy of Turkey, but they have faced off with Turkey in Syria. Yeah. This has nothing to do with the economy. The government can freely uh, operate. This has nothing to do with the Lebanese government. And that's government. the thing. Lebanon but has a huge, huge advantage, right? Because it's got so many different sects and because all these different sects have... Um, commonalities with other countries, right? So, for example, the Sunnis with Turkey, the Shiites with Iran, the yeah. the Maronites with the West. You can actually play all of these different geopolitical Definitely. superpowers against each other and benefit from it. But instead, unfortunately, we see Lebanon, a country, putting all of its eggs in one basket. And this, basket, to me, yeah. is a mistake. It is definitely, we know it, but at the same time, the elite which has been running Lebanon since the 1975 war, the warlords of that war that took the lives of more than 200,000 Lebanese people, they are still suffocating their supporters. They are suffocating their own supporters. I mean, for God's sake, during Eid, we heard uh, a, 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 a Lebanese sheikh in Tripoli going out while COVID-19 is up and awake, he went out in, in a public space where people were gathered, no social distancing, if I may, but people were gathering there. They were standing near one another. He was giving a speech about how Bashar al-Assad is bad, how Turkey is, is here to help us, how Hezbollah is the Hezbo shaitan, how we should turn against one another. I was like, I hope he just mentioned the bread. I hope he mentions bread. I hope he mentions gasoline. I hope he mentions jobs. Everyone around him is jobless. How dare he start talking about mm. sectarianism at this point in time? And at the end of his speech, he tells people to go around and shake one another's hands because this is how Prophet Muhammad used to shake the hands of his companions. I was like, dude, Dude, we don't have hospitals that would take all these people in. We don't have yeah. ventilators. What are you doing? We don't have social security. Yeah. We don't have anything. So this is basically I'll, I'll what speaking happened. Of, uh, speaking of Erdogan, you know, the, uh, there has been some reports recently that here's a sense of, you know, a lack of political will in Lebanon, a power vacuum, if you like, and that yeah. Erdogan is seeing an opportunity there because, after all, he's in Libya and he's in, you know, Idlib. Iraq and yeah. Syria and so on. So what's yeah. the what's the latest on the the presence of the, the Erdogan caliphate in, in Lebanon? Mm -hmm. Lebanon has been known to be for years now. I think I think it's farther before even Lebanon was created. It's before 1943 even. Lebanon has been known to be a hub for international intelligence agencies. Everybody is here, and I mean everybody. Uh, but at the same time, Turkey, uh, look, if, if you speak from a geopolitical uh, angle, they have every, uh, uh, it's not right, but they have every reason to actually come and take away that power vacuum that Saudi Arabia left in the northern part of Lebanon. You know, the northern part of Lebanon where in the 2008 uh, uh, Nahr al-Barid uh, uh, war happened, we lost a lot of good uh, men from the Lebanese army who fought against uh, al-Qaeda at that time, who then fled into Syria, into dormant cells, and then they were activated again in 2011 against the people of Syria and the Syrian government. Erdogan has been uh, supporting these people uh, since then, not from now. But then they had basic support from Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and Qatar as well. But now, because of the power vacuum that you spoke about, because Saudi Arabia is so uh, now, uh, it has a hands full in Yemen, killing the people there like there's no tomorrow. Uh, it has uh, uh, problems, economic problems in its own uh, uh, territory. Turkey found a way into the northern part of Lebanon, just the, the, the way they found in, uh, a way into Idlib. But let me be very clear. All the money that Turkey will be willing to spend in northern Lebanon will go for nothing. First of all, 
the number of people who are uh, accepting this sort of help or aid, if you will, from the Turkish government, they are not willing to fight anymore. There's a basic reason for that. They are not able to live. How are they going to fight? Even if you give them all the money in the world, how are you going to make them hold weapons against each other when they know that the people are not even thinking about wars anymore, geostrategic wars or geopolitical wars? They are thinking how they are going to feed their families. Everyone is jobless. Even if they get $100 every month, let's say, from uh, Turkey, how much is Turkey willing to pay? They are willing to pay for like a thousand men, two thousand men. That's nothing compared to the, the, the hundreds of thousands of people who are jobless, who, who need to eat on a daily basis, who are left there to die. The government doesn't even look at them. And at the same time, there is a power imbalance of power with the Lebanese resistance that if they try anything, I'll be very honest with you, the Lebanese military is capable of suppressing them by itself. It doesn't even need the help of uh, uh, the Lebanese resistance. We did see that in Nahr al -Bered. There was a lot of loss of life. I do, uh, I do say that. I'm not hiding that fact that we did lose a lot of uh, very uh, courageous lives from the Lebanese army uh, back then. But the Lebanese army was able to liberate the area to push them out and to arrest everyone, and um, mostly the people who were left involved. So the Lebanese army is strong enough to stop any sort of uh, skirmish, skirmishes that might happen. But if Erdogan is, uh, has in his mind that he wants to turn the northern part of Lebanon to something similar to Idlib, I think that his consultants are either out of this planet or he just wants uh, a foot in, in the political... Uh, a spectrum of Lebanon, and I think yes, I, I heard a report that you know the, there are vehicles that he would operate through the Future Party, for example. Perhaps he could exercise influence through existing channels. But, but can you imagine what the Saudis would do to, to uh, Hariri if that happens? This is what happened, uh, by the way, when his brother was trying to take over the uh, Future Movement. I don't know if you heard about that. Baha al Hariri tried to take over the uh, Future Movement. We had a lot of uh, street skirmishes, people shooting at one another from the Future Movement. One with Saad al Hariri, one with Baha al Hariri. It was very, very confusing to everyone. But at the same time, it was interesting to see that brothers we're fighting because one is pro Turkey, one is pro Saudi Arabia. One wants to come mm. and become, uh, to become back to Lebanon and become the uh, royal uh, prince of uh, Turkey, get the money needed to get back into politics or to start his political life. And the other has been spanked by Saudi Arabia, afraid to take a flight anymore. But at the same time, he has a responsibility towards his uh, supporters. So it's, it was really interesting, but very, very sad at the same time. Now let's turn okay. to the enemy in the south if, if we can, because uh, the enemy in the south never goes away and it determines a lot of um, of the, the future of Lebanon. Um, what happened recently, Marwa, in uh, the Sheba area there? What What's going on? The story is that they're shooting, at, they're firing at themselves and then issuing contradictory stories about what happened. Does anyone really know what happened there? Look, it's... It it's really funny for me. I, I won't. I won't lie. Mm. What happened? Uh, but the day that thing happened was um, everyone was there at the edge of their seats. Everyone, whether uh, on the uh, Palestinian occupied side or the Lebanese side. This is just behind you in the in the hills behind you now, isn't it? Yes, definitely in the hills behind me. I was not here. Uh, I had left the day a day earlier to uh, go and do my show in Beirut. But what happened is that the Zionist entity has been anticipating a retaliatory attack by the Lebanese resistance because they, uh, two weeks ago, they uh, targeted uh, the uh, Damascus International Airport uh, in, uh, I think it was, it was uh, June 23, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it was a Monday and they targeted Damascus International Airport and one martyr for the Lebanese resistance fell. Uh, and we already know that Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah from last year, from uh, September 2019, he had already initiated a threat and uh, against the uh, Zionist entity saying that if any of our fighters, any fighter, whether he has, uh, whether he's a commander or just a soldier, if he's targeted by Israel anywhere, not only in Syria, anywhere on this planet, we will retaliate inside the Palestinian occupied territories. This was very clear when back then in September 20, 2019, they also targeted an, a Damascus, a, a suburban Damascus, and they, they actually targeted a house. 
and they killed two uh, Hezbollah uh, fighters who were taking a break from uh, uh, the field. But uh, two weeks ago, as I said, they targeted again Damascus International Airport and Hezbollah was silent. They radio silence, no, not even a word. They just said that we lost one martyr. They had his uh, procession and uh, they said nothing. Absolutely nothing. One day before uh, the Israelis went on and started shooting at themselves, uh, we had uh, uh, the deputy uh, <laughs> secretary general of, of Hezbollah, uh, Sheikh Naim Qasim, go on Al Mayadeen TV channel. He had a long, a lengthy interview there, and he was asked about this, and he said, "We don't have to say anything. Let them wait. They know that we will retaliate. We'll just say nothing about it." We have every right to retaliate. That's it. That's the only thing he said. The next morning, Sheba farms were on fire. Farshuba hills were on fire. Uh, Hebariye hills were on fire. These are three different villages right here, just, uh, just behind me. The Israelis were going crazy. The Israeli media went frenzy over the fact that certain group of the resistance is supposedly or allegedly uh, trying to infiltrate Palestinian occupied territories to uh, uh, retaliate against the, uh, uh, the, the martyrdom of their uh, 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 fighter brother. We heard nothing in the Lebanese media. We were waiting. We were just sitting, waiting to watch on Al Manar to listen to Al Noor uh, station, which has both Hezbollah um, owned uh, uh, media. Nothing. I was actually in my studio preparing to uh, record and I was uh, preparing to record and talk about the Israeli paranoia while waiting for the retaliatory attacks by Hezbollah. And we just stopped. We need we waited for like 20 minutes to see what was going on. And we started having from the Israeli media reports saying that uh, there were five martyrs for the resistance, that their bodies were being lifted, but no one can lift them, that uh, now um, uh, the Israeli uh, fighter jets are ready to go and bomb certain areas in Beirut. It was all psychological warfare going on mm. and everyone was at the edge of their seats until 7 p.m. Beirut time when the resistance issued its statement. I mm. laughed so hard. My tears were running down my cheek. I kid you not. <laughs> the, the statement said that Nothing happened. The Israelis are so paranoid. They are so afraid that they started shooting at one another. The Israelis said, yeah. no, we have videos. We have videotapes that proves the, the situation. Where are the videotapes? Show us. Bring mm. us the evidence. Nothing happened. They are so afraid. There's a deterrence so great from the resistance, from this small resistance in this tiny little default of a country that is so deterring the, the enemy, the front line, that they're now shooting at one another. If you go to the other end of the occupied territories of Lebanon down further south, we are here a bit of uh, southeast of Lebanon. If you go further south to Lebanon, near the uh, uh, so-called Avivim military base, it's on the border with uh, Maisel Jabal village in Lebanon, uh, where uh, last year in September, the uh, Hezbollah retaliated there and they shot um, uh, uh, rockets against a moving armed vehicle for the uh, uh, Israeli occupation forces right there. We have a full two minute video that shows you how the, the soldiers in that military base are hiding behind vans trying to cross from one building to another. They wait there and then they run from one building to another because they're afraid to be sniped by the resistance. They are so mm. afraid to a point that it's laughable. They're punching so themselves. Is that, that's yeah, they <laughs> punched them and oh, look, Hezbollah did it. And we yeah. hold the Lebanese government responsible. This is what they have been saying for the past two weeks. We hold the Lebanese uh, government responsible for any retaliatory attack from Hezbollah and we will bomb Beirut if, it's, uh, if it takes us there. They will not even bomb Khiem and we are on the border. You know why? Well, because Well, that's what, the, that's what they've been saying for some years, isn't it, really? And I wonder if the Americans are running the same line that they, they now refuse to the, the enemy refuses to distinguish between Hezbollah and Lebanon and the because they know that the resistance is has substantial place in the in the government of Lebanon and really well, it's a, it's arbitrary to distinguish between the two i wonder within an economic sense the americans are effectively doing the same thing i mean the the sanctions against the resistance are effectively damaging the entire country 
Well, the, the Americans keep saying that they are, pro, they are a pro-democratic entity. That's a laughable, very laughable definition for, for what they call themselves or refer to themselves. In 2018, there was a parliamentary elections in Lebanon and Hezbollah and the pro-resistance movement in Lebanon won the majority in the Lebanese parliament. They have 72 seats in the parliament. And this is democratic elections and elections via an electoral law that was accepted by every party in Lebanon. They took part in it. They have their own members of parliament in it. I'm talking about Jaja, I'm talking about Hariri, I'm talking about Jumblad, everyone. So this is this was the most democratic election ever seen on Lebanese land because it was a new law that included even minorities in it. The Americans were not happy. Why? Because they weren't happy with the results of this election. They don't want the resistance to be part of uh, the Lebanese parliament. They don't want the resistance to be part of the Lebanese government, despite the fact that it's the people electing them. So you want to take now decisions on behalf of the people. This is what you want to do. This is what America does. This is what it has been doing to Syria. This is what it did to Iraq, etc. But when it comes to uh, what's going on now with the Israeli entity, look, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's laughable, but I'm not, I'm not laughing at the capabilities of the Israeli entity. They have brought down Lebanon to its, uh, to its knees literally three times already in the past uh, 30 years. We know that they are militarily capable, but now we have a resistance that is determined this terrorism from us. It is, it is stopping them from entering our villages anytime they want. It is stopping them from going up and bombing us any anytime they want. And as I speak to you now, you can't hear it, but there are more than three drones in my sky taking of my village, of my land, of my people, because they are paranoid. And we are capable. We know that we are capable as a country to live safely only because we have this resistance that is defending us, that has defended us since 1982 up until now, creating this balance of power with, with the most powerful enemy in the region. I'll scratch that with the most powerful uh, military force in the region. They are not able to get an F. Uh, 35, an F-16, an F-50, whatever F they have, they're not capable of getting it up in the air because they are afraid it will be down the same way that the Syrian army down their plane in the occupied Golan Heights last year because they know that resistance now has the capability to down those planes and to stop them from bombing and killing my people, wherever my people are from, wherever their sect is, wherever their religion is. When one bomb falls on my people, it's falling on everyone. This is what they don't understand. Whether or not they have supporters in Lebanon, it's not a factor when bombs start falling on people. We did see in 2006 that, yes, there was some sort of a split personality between Lebanese who people were being bombed and the other people were actually having, enjoying summer on the beach, but they heard that. They went down to Beirut and saw the destruction. This is not going to happen again, not because I'm saying so, because basically the capabilities, the military expertise that the Lebanese resistance, Hezbollah, has gained from the 10-year war on Syria is so massive that Israel does not know how it's going to start and when it's going to end. Mm. Oh, well, we're going to have to do a part two on this, I think, because we're I think so. out of time now. <laughs> but I just wonder in one last question if you might want to say, uh, are there any signs of hope in the catastrophe that's befallen the, the region? The economic war is particularly intense. Do you see any signs of hope there? That's where I'm very, uh, I'm afraid to say that at first I was disappointed because, um, look, I, I'm not going to lie. I wanted uh, the, the resistance in Lebanon to take more part in anti-corruption matters. But how much can they do, to be honest? How much at, at how many fronts are they willing to fight? Are we going to give them now the responsibility to clean the Lebanese financial crisis when they had nothing to do with it? Were they not even part of the government up until 2010 when they took, I think they took like uh, one minister in the government. And now they have, I, th I think they have uh, one, two, I think they have uh, two, maximum three ministers in the government now. Are we going to hold them also responsible for this? Personally, I won't, but I do understand the people who emotionally are attached to the resistance to a point that now they are saying, look, we need you to work more on anti-corruption uh, cases, to fight corruption, to stop the people who at some point are your allies in Lebanese polit politics inside of Lebanon that are destroying the lives of the Lebanese people because of their monopoly, because of their uh, gangster style uh, behavior against uh, the Lebanese people. But this is not what, what Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah has said 
several times that this is not the responsibility of the resistance because this will end up in a clash that the resistance does not want. The resistance, mm -hmm. the, the weapons of the resistance are against the enemy. There are no enemies for the resistance in Lebanon. There are political mm -hmm. foes for the resistance. Even if the enemy, if the if, if the the foes believe that Hezbollah is their enemy, Hezbollah would not view them as their enemy. Not because of any uh, moral uh, uh, definition of it, but because he knows how destructive this could lead to if we go into an open uh, uh, clash with the people who are just political. Fo I mean, we can always fix things at a political level, but at an economic level. If we try to fix this locally, it's not going to work because we don't have the capabilities to do though. So if we want to try and get help from outside, the Americans were very clear that they will suffocate us with sanctions and this is what they are doing. Mm -hmm. We are at a point where we are stuck. We don't know what happens next. We don't know if jobs will continue after that, the pandemic. We don't know if we're going back to classes or not. We don't know if people are going to operate freely, if they're going to be able to travel, to continue their businesses outside of Lebanon. We are stuck. It's a dead block. It's, 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 it's more of a, a, a self-imposed blockade plus an American-imposed blockade. It is that complicated. And I don't see any bright future. The oh, we're going to have to. Uh, we're going to want to impose on you to come back a second time to continue this because I think there's a lot more we want to okay. hear from. You. But we appreciate so much your your insight, your your specialist uh, understandings of Lebanon. Thank you very much for sharing this time with us today. Thank you for having me with you, and you, uh, I'm sorry for taking too long to answer your questions. I'm I'm pretty happy to be with you uh, on another time. No worries. Thank you so much.